What's up folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi and we have just gotten a surprise sort of FAQ from the Games Workshop events team. In just a few weeks, the Warhammer World Championship event is gonna be held in Atlanta, Georgia. This event is being held from November 14th through 16th and allows players who have qualified via a golden ticket by winning a qualifying GT or major level event that applied for membership within a Warhammer World Championship circuit to participate in the event. Now, this is an officially sanctioned circuit. This isn't something like the I ETC, the independent tournament circuit uh, that is run by Frontline Gaming and culminates in the Las Vegas Open every year. This is Games Workshop's official competitive circuit, so event rulings for that circuit are as close to we can get as out of season FAQs as is physically possible which is why it was extremely exciting when an FAQ document was sent to players who had already achieved golden tickets, providing some rulings on contentious issues for the event. Now, this is not an official FAQ, but it is relatively close to it. As far as I know, this has been created by the Games Workshop's event team that are interpreting the rules, I think with some communication with the rules team. But it sounds like the narrative is that were we to see an FAQ to the core rules tomorrow, the changes that are within this this document would be made in that FAQ. Now, from what I understand, the Warhammer rules team is restricted on the number of updates they can make to the core rules at any one time, which is why these are being issued in an event FAQ for their world championships rather than a core rules FAQ where it would affect every event. And these are some pretty major changes. It's a single one page document with a question and answer format. So we're just gonna read through every question one at a time. The first one being some abilities require units that are below their starting strength to take a battle shock test in the battle shock step of their command phase. If such a unit is also below half strength, how many battle shock tests will the unit take in total? The answer being one. The interesting thing about this is that some units in the game, and I actually ran afoul to this on a recent video, uh, have the same ability, but specify the the number of tests that it caps out at. For example, Harkin World Claimer specifies that it does not stack with the, the normal Battleshock step check. Because most of the other abilities in this vein do not have that, it's safe to assume that they are uncapped, but that is apparently not the case. Question two, units with the big guns never tire ability or that are equipped with pistol weapons are eligible to shoot in their controlling player's shooting phase even when within engagement range of enemy units. Can these abilities be used to make them eligible to shoot in other phases such as using fire overwatch? The answer being no. This is a very contentious one and uh, one that I think most TOs around the world have come on the same side uh, as the event team here. Because fire overwatch requires the unit firing the overwatch to be eligible were it the controlling player's shooting phase, it sounds like you can use abilities that allow you to shoot in melee while engaged if you're firing Overwatch. However, the thing to keep in mind is that rules that trigger out of phase never apply in different phases, and Overwatch being movement or charge phase, any rules that apply during the shooting phase are not going to apply during a resolution of the stratagem. So, even though you have an ability like pistol or big guns that retire that would make you eligible to shoot, it was questionable whether or not that actually triggered. When a unit counts as having made a move of any kind due to an effect or ability, has that unit made a move for the purposes of abilities that trigger at the start or end of a move? Now, this is specifically, I think, going to come into play for reserve units. Reserve units count as having made a normal move at the end of the reserve. This means that if things like cult ambush tokens that are destroyed, when enemies end a move within nine inches of them are potentially not going to expire when a reinforcement unit is set up near them. This could also be the case for many kinds of reactive moves that trigger when an enemy moves within a certain distance of them, especially for units that can come in closer than normal out of reserve, those not triggering any sort of these reactive or disruptive abilities is a big deal. Now it's important to note that Overwatch is still eligible on units that are setting up on the table, whether or not that's disembarking from a transport or setting up out of reserve. Overwatch specifically allows you to target units that are setting up within range of you in addition to units that are starting or ending moves. When a transport arrives from reserves in the reinforcement step of its controlling player's movement phase, are embarked units eligible to disembark? The answer being no. This is 
is another weird one. If you look through the core rules, it actually doesn't tell you when units disembark. The rules just specify that it occurs in the movement phase, but not which step of the movement phase. So there is an argument to be made that a uh, transport could come out of reserve, be forced to be a particular uh, horizontal distance away from enemies, usually nine inches, then disembark units closer and charge with those units. <laughs> Especially if you had something like assault ramp that allowed you to charge after the transport, if you disembark after the transport move, that was potentially legal, but a lot of events had house rules against it. I think that the only reasonable interpretation of the rules, in my opinion, was that transports are only allowed to disembark during the movement step of the movement phase, not the reinforcement step. And that is the conclusion that the Games Workshop events team uh, has, has also come to. If a model equipped with a one-shot weapon shoots with that weapon and later embarks in a transport with firing deck, can that one-shot weapon be selected for use via firing deck, the answer being no. This also meshes with the next question. If a unit equipped with a one-shot weapon is embarked with a transport, and then a transport attacks with that weapon using the firing deck ability, which model is considered to have shot with that weapon for the purposes of the one-shot ability? The answer being that the controlling player must select one embarked model equipped with that one-shot weapon. That model is now considered to have shot with that one-shot weapon and will not be eligible to shoot with it again for the remainder of the battle. This is a pretty clean resolution to a lot of the interactions between one-shot weapons and embarked transports. One-shot weapons are weapons that the bearer can only select to use once per game. After they've used it, uh, it is still on their profile, but never again eligible to attack with. These are usually one-use things like bombs or missiles. It was an open question, is the transport a new bearer of a <laughs> one-shot weapon, or are they now eligible to use it? I think obviously the intention was that, you know, once you've thrown your bomb, getting into a vehicle and being able to throw the bomb out the top clearly doesn't give you a second bomb. So this is a a, a very clean, very clean cleanup of uh, what is otherwise a pretty big loophole within the rules. Uh, transports and open firing deck transports still have a lot of weird issues that I don't believe are covered in this document. For example, it is possible, and I've talked about this a couple times in videos, to be firing twice per turn. If you have the ability to embark or disembark from a transport mid shooting phase, there's a lot of weird gray area with this rule, and this at least closes one of the, the loopholes. How does the Melta ability interact with abilities that modify? damage characteristics. The answer being that bonus damage from melted weapons is a modifier and follows the normal process for applying modifiers. This is an interesting one that has to do with the new modifier sequencing rules in 10th edition. If you have effects that, for example, have the incoming damage of attacks, they are applied first. First, any replacement effects are applied, then division and multiplication. So if you have, for example, in a, a unit like the Incarn that has incoming damage, you would calculate the damage of the attack first First, then add Melta on top of that. So for example, if you were firing a D6 plus two Melta shot at the Incarn, you would fire it, uh, it the attack goes through miraculously through Fate, Dice, and Invuln save. You roll a four for damage, that gets halved to a two. However, if you're in Melta range, after that step of the process, you will then add two more for the Melta ability. So you'd actually be dealing four damage to the Incarn. Similarly, if you have uh, something like a Blade of Armor, where the damage characteristic of your attack is changed to zero, you would replace the D6 of the of the uh, attacking weapon characteristic with a zero, then add your Melta on top. So a Blade of Armor, for example, is you're still gonna be taking two damage from Melta weapons or weapons with bonus damage. This is also the case for enhancement weapons that get bonus damage. There's a lot of other bonus damage uh, situations in the game that can be affected by this. And this is core rules, by the way. This is uh, all laid out in the rules commentary. The uh, events team is just going along with what is otherwise the rules as written. Some abilities allow a unit to be targeted with a stratagem for zero CP. Can such an ability be used on a command reroll stratagem? The answer being yes. The unit that the reroll is being used in relation to is considered to have been targeted with the command reroll stratagem. This is uh, a pretty vague wording, um, but again, plugging a little bit of a gray area. The core rules don't specify a target for command reroll, so it's not eligible to be used rules as written with effects like rights of battle that allow you to target a unit with a stratagem. However, the rules commentary refers to command reroll targeting, even though it doesn't actually have a target. So it was up in the air whether or not you were able to use command reroll with free stratagem effects. Generally speaking, the answer was no, but it sounds like that is going to be changed in the near future. Some abilities remove a unit from the battlefield after the first battle round has started and place it into strategic reserves. If that ability states, it will arrive back on the battlefield in the reinforcement step of your next movement phase, or that that unit has the deep strike ability, can such an ability allow a unit to arrive on the battlefield during the first battle round? The answer being yes. When doing so, set that unit up on the battlefield as if it were the second battle round. However, it does not allow other abilities 
abilities to arrive from strategic reserves during the first battle round. This is very targeted in what it affects. It is only effects that place you into strategic reserves, but then specifically place you back on the table the next phase, the next movement phase. Whereas there are some abilities like the ones that are mentioned that have kind of a nebulous timing. You just go into strategic reserve and then arrive at a legal point later on in the game. A good example of this is Chaos Demons. They have an ability to enter strategic reserve at the end of your opponent's turn, then set up in your next movement phase. If you use that on the first battle round, despite the fact that strategic reserves cannot normally enter on the first battle round, because the game would blue screen if you didn't allow them to arrive, you would both be forced to arrive and not be allowed to arrive. This FAQ is allowing those units to be set up. Now, the next question is basically along the same vein. Some abilities remove a unit from the battlefield, state that the unit will return in the reinforcement step of the next movement phase, but do not make use of strategic reserves or deep strike. Can such an ability allow a unit to arrive on the battlefield during the first battle round? The answer being yes, almost exactly like we talked about before. This just allows the classic uppy downy kind of effects like Grey Knight teleporters, uh, Calidus assassins, and Alaris terminators to actually use their abilities on the first battle round, which is, I believe, allowed by the rules commentary since they count as reserves that started on the table, which are allowed to redeploy on the first battle round, but isn't really explicitly stated. Some abilities such as Strands of Fate or Acts of Faith occur before making a dice roll. Can such an ability be used as part of a re-roll? The answer being yes. Uh, a re-roll is simply a second roll according to the core rules, and these effects come into play anytime you roll. So what this allows you to do, for example, is when you're playing Eldar, you are uh, rolling your hit dice or your wound dice, and then using Unparalleled Foresight to re-roll one of those once per activation. You can pick that back up, roll it again, but before you actually physically roll the dice, choose to sub it out for a fate dice. If a unit with the Infiltrator's ability uses an ability that allows it to redeploy, can it make use of the Infiltrator's ability when redeploying? The answer is no. This is a good clarification since redeploy effects only specify that they use the normal deployment rules. Exactly what the normal deployment rules were was a little bit ambiguous since the infiltrator's ability is included within the deployment rules of the core rulebook, but it's good to have a clarification on that. Moving on, some units such as Mortarian, Trajan Vloris, Granites, and Grandmasters have abilities that allow certain models or units to ignore modifiers to their characteristics. Do such abilities allow them to ignore the modifiers to the characteristics of weapons equipped by those models or units as well? The answer being no. This was another one that had no clear answer within the core rules. So I'm glad we're getting clarification on a lot of these. And the answer being no, I think makes sense. Uh, a, a model, model's characteristics are their own. Their weapons are their own. Things like Trajan Vloris and Mortarian's Aura are not going to affect things like minus one damage, Duty Eternal. They're not going to affect minus one AP, for example, from Armor of Contempt. However, things that they will still ignore, it's important to note, are things like Stealth, minus one to hit, minus one to wound. Those are effects of roles for the model in question. And uh, most of those abilities both allow you to ignore modifiers to roles that the unit makes. And that will affect hit and wound rolls. So that will affect attacks made with their weapons, just not modifiers to the characteristics of their weapons specifically. Next up, some abilities such as Path of Command, Lord Solar, Hive Commander, grant one CP at the start of their controlling player's command phase. Does this CP count towards the limit of each player only being able to gain one CP per battle round? The answer being yes. I think this one was pretty clear cut in the rules, but I could understand the argument that uh, it was a little bit confusing. The core rules state that only one CP is allowed to be generated per battle round outside of the CP generated in the command phase. Whether or not that that uh, CP in the command phase was plural or singular was never <laughs> specified. So if you gained multiple CP in the command phase, nobody knew whether or not that counted against the cap that you can gain of one command point per battle round. It, it seemed like the implication was that it was yes, some events ruled otherwise, but again, we're clarifying some gray areas. You are not going to be allowed to gain more than one command point per battle round beyond the normal one that the core rules grant you. Last, but certainly not least, another one that we have no clear resolution for within the core rules of the game. If a unit that contains character, monster, or vehicle models fails several hazardous tests at the same time, how are those effects of failed tests applied? This is specifically for multi 
multi-model character monster or vehicle units. So the most important one being here, uh, Crisis Battlesuits, which will typically carry three hazardous weapons per battlesuit and have multiple vehicles within the unit, one of those vehicles also being a character. The hazardous weapon rules specify that each time a hazardous check is failed for a character or vehicle, you choose one of those models within the unit to assign mortal wounds thanks to the failed hazardous check to. Mortal wound assignment doesn't tell you how to assign mortal wounds to specific models, only how to resolve them when applied to a unit. So whether or not it followed the normal rules was totally up to interpretation. The answer here is that for each failed hazardous test, the unit's controlling player selects one model in the unit equipped with a hazardous weapon. That model suffers the relevant effects of the failed tests, either being destroyed or suffering three mortal wounds until it is destroyed, at which point the player selects another model equipped with a hazardous weapon, repeating until there are no further tests to assign. So this is essentially a slight rewriting of the core rules in order to make it work a little bit more cleanly. So your hazardous tests can be assigned to anyone, not necessarily a model that's already wounded, for example, or a model that you couldn't target normally with an attack. And then you continuously suffer damage on that model until it's dead. The question though, and there's still some open questions here. I believe the intention is that the model chosen suffers all three mortal wounds. And since those mortal wounds are applied one at a time, they will not then carry over to other models in the unit, but that may need some clarification in the future. I the benefit here is that we now know that it's impossible to spread hazardous checks around your whole unit. Unit, as the rules imply that you potentially could assign mortal wounds to every single model in the unit before anyone dies. And with that, those are all of the, uh, what are essentially unofficial FAQs from the World Championships. I think we can kind of take away that these are what are likely to be the intention of the designers, if not the letter of the law. So the, my hope is that we start to see some standardization between TOs where they adopt these rulings in order to use them for their uh, events as well. Now, the fact that this is not an official FAQ that has been printed on Warhammer Community, it's only been shown to a very small number of people, is very frustrating to me. It feels like maybe before your World Championships, if you have open questions in your core roles, you should lock those in before uh, you know putting a, a big spotlight on the competitive scene and the particular mechanics of your game. But you know, it is what it is. We <laughs> At least we have this, I guess. Let me know down in the comment section how you feel about these changes. Big thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel either over on Patreon, patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members, and Twitch subscribers. I love you all. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming. gaming.